Happy Monday, everyone. It's John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. But not only is it Monday, it's also New Year's Eve. I hope that you guys have some plans, are going to be safe, and still squeeze out as much fun as you can tonight. Um, also, we've got some stuff coming up on the channel I just want to touch on. 2019 looks like it's going to be pretty interesting. First of all, this is the last episode where we're going to use the old Case Cracked intro. We've got a brand new intro that's going to be debuting on the channel very soon here. Of course, I've got a special project I'm working on with Danielle Hallen and Sheila Wysocki for CrimeCon. I'll let you know more about that as we get closer. And another podcast I've been working on for the past few months that's going to debut later this year as well. A lot going on in 2019. And I want to thank you so much for being a part of my team and helping me get these opportunities. I can't do it without you guys. So thank you so much. With all that being said, let's get into today's mystery. It's one that I like to call Unhappy New Year. New Year's Eve is a very exciting time for people. Getting together with loved ones, cutting loose, and of course, figuring out your New Year's resolutions. However, for Brad Baker, all his plans for 1981 would come to an untimely end on December 31st, 1980. Brad Baker was a 30-year-old man in the prime of his professional life. An Indiana native with degrees in business and public administration, who was said to don a three-piece suit just as easily as wearing bib overalls. Brad started his career working in Virginia on Galmary Farms owned by an elderly couple who badly needed a manager. During his tenure there, he made friends with the family farm across the street known as Kinlock Estate, which was ran by the Courier family. After his current employer came down with cancer, Brad turned his ambitions to the much larger Courier farm. Over time, he became close friends with the owners who were known for raising Angus cattle and racehorses. Even though the farm was much smaller than it had been, the three children of the owners were now taking an interest in its activities. And after their parents died, they hired Brad to manage the farm's cattle, hay, and feed operations. He even moved into an abandoned farmhouse on the property. On December 31st, the Courier children, Michael, Andrea, and Lavinia Courier, were all out of town. Andrea was honeymooning in the Caribbean, Lavinia was vacationing in Paris, and Michael was in New York. While they were away, Brad had to handle a very important business issue, firing James Allen, the previous manager. This came as no surprise to the people in town. The Courier family had looked to replace Allen for some time, and now with their new manager, Brad, in place, that time had finally come. Later that evening, Brad had planned to attend a New Year's Eve party with a lady friend who was a radiologist at Fakir Hospital and recently separated from her husband. About 7.30 p.m., the woman called Brad, waking him up. She planned to drive through a snowstorm, and Brad was going to get showered and ready to go to the party, which was only three miles from the farm. When she arrived around 9 p.m., she was shocked to find him bleeding profusely. Without hesitation, she drove to the party to try to get some help. Brad was flown by helicopter to the Washington Hospital Center, where he died on New Year's Day at 2.40 p.m. His killer, who found him dressing for the party, shot him in the living room. Police dismissed robbery as a motive since everything in the house appeared to still be there. They quickly labeled Brad's murder possibly a grudge murder, something a jealous husband might do. After breaking in through the front door, the killer confronted Brad with a 20-gauge shotgun and shot him in the head. Then, as he lay wounded, the killer reloaded the gun and fired a second shot into Brad's groin. You would think a farm murder in a relatively small town would be easily solved, but the investigation seemed to be full of possible suspects. All 36 employees at the farm were questioned, but those leads just didn't seem to pan out. For years, the case would seem to go cold. Then in 1995, with a new sheriff in office, new interviews were conducted with those old suspects, and they finally caught their break. Little did they know that they had previously talked to the killer's family. And now, one of his brothers, who was going through a rough divorce, was willing to give investigators the tip they needed. And this brother knew all about the crime, since he was actually there to witness it. He also told police about the motive, 
which was all about that fired manager, James Allen. Allen had told his wife, Mary Frances, that they were going to lose their home now that he had been fired. Mary Frances became enraged and called her son, Ronald Cloud, who was James's stepson. She ranted and raved about the firing, according to her daughter, Colleen Allen Holland. She also heard her mother say that Brad Baker needed to be taken care of. Ronald and his brother Ernest headed over to the farm. Ernest is the one that would eventually tip off the police and testify against his own brother, Ronald. I got a phone call from my brother about going with him to Brad Baker's. Ernest Cloud said he and his brother drove about an hour to Fakir. Uh, Ernest said he had drunk about eight beers and he carried his 38 caliber revolver. His brother had his shot off 20 gauge shotgun, which he concealed under a trench coat. Ronald Cloud knocked on the door and claimed he and his brother were in an accident and needed help. Brad, sensing trouble, went into a bedroom and grabbed a shotgun. Then Ronald Cloud allegedly broke a window to open the door. His brother and Brad both fired their shotguns. It happened so quickly, I could not tell who shot first, Ernest testified. I recall that after Brad Baker had fell, my brother walked up and shot him a second time in the groin and said he would make it look like a hate crime, Ernest said. Uh, Ernest also said that he remained on the porch outside, but Ronald insisted he also fire his gun. I closed my eyes and shot twice into the house with the revolver, Ernest Cloud said. Ernest Cloud testified he didn't know his brother planned to kill Mr. Baker and went along with the hope that cool heads would prevail. Even walking down the road to the house, I told my brother we shouldn't be doing this, Ernest Cloud testified. On the way home to West Virginia in a driving snowstorm, they stopped several times to throw out their guns and Ronald Cloud's prosthetic left hand, which was damaged in the gunfight. Ronald had originally lost his hand in the Vietnam War. Ronald was now facing four charges, but when he confessed and pled guilty, three of the charges were dropped, leaving him charged only with first degree murder. At the time of his confession, Ronald Cloud was in jail stemming from a 1988 arrest where he received a life sentence in prison for a kidnapping and rape in West Virginia. Wearing a dark blue prison jumpsuit, white socks, and slip-on sneakers, Cloud, now in his 60s, shuffled quietly into the courtroom. I'm sorry that it happened, Ronald Cloud told the judge. Prosecutors asked for a life sentence to ensure Cloud never gets out of prison, just in case West Virginia changes its sentencing laws. I didn't go there to shoot that man. I told him that, and he shot me. I went through a lot of things, emotional things. What if he'd had a bigger gun or more bullets? I'd be the dead one, not him. The killer added that he wanted to look Mr. Baker's family members in the eye and tell them I'm sorry. After finally cutting off Cloud as he repeated assertions that he didn't mean to kill Brad, the judge said, the court is going to sentence you to life in prison. Ronald's brother Ernest stated, I fully accept what I've done. He also said that he specifically witnessed the second shot intended to make the killing look like a crime of passion. Despite Ernest admitting to lying repeatedly to investigators about the crime over the years, he received no charges. The victim's sister, Blythe Joy Pattonode, said in a family impact statement, Brad's death had a devastating impact on my mother, who became consumed first with trying to understand why, and then depressed when no answers could be found. She searched high and low and tried mightily to cope with the pain of losing her eldest son. My mother suffered the most. Brad's death prevented him from submitting and defending his doctoral work in Argo economics. It robbed him of his dream of managing the Kinlock estate. The sum total of Brad's loss to his family or his friends cannot be measured in a few paragraphs. Case cracked. So, yeah, um, really interesting case. It's, it's crazy to me that the brother, after that amount of time, 15 years, would turn on the original brother when he had all these previous opportunities. And I have to tell you guys, I really wonder about this aspect. Um, obviously, 
obviously he had to explain why his bullets from his gun that were on him, Ernest I'm talking about, wound up in the house. And I just don't know if I buy this story of, well, I was standing outside the whole time. My brother came out and told me I had to shoot some rounds in there. So I covered my eyes and I just pointed the gun and shot in there. I really don't know if that's true or not. I wonder if there's something else going on here. I wonder what happened within the family. Was there some type of weird family dynamic where Ernest finally wanted to get back at Ronald? Um, plus, Ronald did not seem like a good guy. This is a guy that was already sitting in prison um, for a rape charge. So it's, um, I don't know. I don't know if things changed for Ernest at some point, but without his information and his testimony against his brother, I don't think this case would have come through at all. So... I'm kind of glad it did, but I'm also very surprised that no charges came towards Ernest at all. And that story about the bullets just, I don't know, kind of hits me in a weird place. What do you guys think? Let's talk about it in the comments down below. Thank you so much for joining me here on New Year's Eve. I hope you guys have a wonderful one, and I will see you back on Wednesday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight right here on the Lord and Arts channel.